Okay, this is the uh, Methodology for Social Science module, and we're now on to lecture number 10. Uh, we're going to be looking around issues connected to dieting for those of you doing the uh, set of interviews around dieting for qualitative analysis. Um, we're also going to have a look at narrative analysis and the techniques of how to engage in narrative analysis and touch a little bit on standpoint theory, although we will be coming back to standpoint theory in next week's lecture in slightly more depth. So this is more of a kind of a, well, not so much an introduction because we actually have already introduced standpoint theory in one of the early lectures, but this is a bit more of a, a reminder prior to getting on to next week's um, lecture topic. So if we start with the broad issue of dieting and how dieting is understood within sociology because obviously you can understand it in, from a psychological perspective, you can understand it from a medical perspective, a, di a dietitian's perspective and so on. It can be understood and approached in a whole variety of different ways. Um, the broadest use of the term diet in not simply a sociological context but any kind of context is quite simply whatever a person normally eats. So it doesn't have to be diet in the sense of losing weight, it's just whatever you happen to eat is your diet. And obviously that is sociologically determined, it's culturally determined in that what a normal diet for someone in um, Western China is will be quite different from a normal diet for somebody in Azerbaijan or in Klakti. So these are shaped by cultural forces, what sort of food is available, what's considered normal to eat, what's not considered normal to eat, and so forth. Um, in terms of normality, there is a, a gap between availability and normality, in that there can be a whole raft of things that you could potentially eat, but which in a given culture nobody would want to eat, or almost nobody would want to eat. So, for example, in this country, we, we could theoretically eat dogs and cats, but obviously virtually no one in Britain would eat a dog or a cat. And if you found out your neighbours had eaten their dog or their cat, you would be probably horrified because it's not considered a normal thing to eat. Um, just as in some parts of the world, um, India, for example, um, in the Hindu regions of India, there's plenty of cows going around and they'll drink the milk of cows and so on. But the idea of eating a cow was, is just anathema. It would not happen. It would be as, as repellent to Hindus to eat a cow as it would be for most of us to eat a dog or a cat. So merely because a source of food is available does not mean it will automatically be consumed. So there is this gap and that gap is determined not so much by individual psychological factors as by broad sociological patterns and sociological trains of norms around what is considered edible, what is considered inedible, or at least inappropriate to eat. Um, notions of, of disgust and revulsion are sociologically structured. Now, the idea of using the word diet to specifically mean a changed regime of eating aimed at achieving a particular body shape is a relatively recent thing. There are cultures we can see around the world who use um, I suppose what we'd call short-term diets, really, to alter somebody's body shape temporarily for a particular event. And quite often the event is frequent things like weddings are a common one. Um, so over here, obviously, in the West, it's very, very common for um, women more so than men, much more so than men, to want to slim down in order to get into a wedding dress that's several sizes too small for them. Um, in other parts of the world, some of the... Um, coastal countries of Africa, for example, the opposite is much more common. That in the lead up to a woman's wedding, she is often packed off to live in a, uh, an isolated hut, separate from the rest of the villages, uh, and, and fed up. She's given a sort of high fat diet to plump her up and make her look bigger for the wedding day, because big is considered attractive and beautiful in those cultures. And if after the wedding she goes back to whatever a normal size is, well, that's kind of equivalent to in the West, you know, someone who's dieted to get into their wedding dress. Then as soon as the wedding day's over, they're shoveling cake down their face and they go back to whatever their normal size is. 
um, and the husband just has to live with that. There aren't many cultures in which men desperately try to change their weight for a wedding. In fact, I can't actually think of any culture off the top of my head, which doesn't mean there isn't one. There, there could be one I'm simply unfamiliar with. Um, but it, it's usually women trying to adjust their appearance for weight. Now, as per the, the um, image on the screen there, body change issues are not confined to women. And I went for a rather slightly comic old uh, illustration from a magazine there to emphasize that men have also had body images over the years and still do for that matter. So that's a man putting on a corset, um, a Victorian illustration. It was fairly common for wealthy Victorian men, um, at least at certain points in their life. I'm sure they, they reach, eventually reached an age where they gave up trying. <laughs> but, um, at certain points in their life to wear corsets to give themselves thinner waists and uh, make their chests look broader by comparison um, to try and amend and adjust their, their size and their appearance, especially men with a military background. That's quite a common thing to do. And to alter their diets accordingly. Uh, and of course, these days you get guys who are very into working out down at the gym and they get very fastidious about what they will eat and what they won't eat in order to increase their muscle size and decrease body fat. So al along with the physical workouts and the exercise regimes, they also have um, a food regime which they would adhere to quite assiduously, sometimes to the point of making themselves very unwell in pursuit of what is at least theoretically a healthy look, they actually engage in very unhealthy behaviours. So whilst we um, in the West at the moment, and certainly since various feminist writers back in the 70s started publishing books and articles and such like, uh, particularly fat is a feminist issue is a very, very popular one. Um, it's come to be seen as a, a heavily female oriented thing. And undoubtedly, the vast majority of dieting magazines and TV programs around dieting and all that kind of palaver, undoubtedly, they, they are by far most heavily oriented towards a female audience. That is a historical fad, shall we say, in that at other periods of history, dieting has been heavily directed towards men, dieting in the sense of trying to change body image. Um, so not necessarily, not necessarily to lose weight, but to change body image in some ways. So it's shifted in and out as to which groups in society get targeted at any given period in history. When we think about food, there is an entire sociology of food, which is a relatively new field of study within sociology, which looks at a whole raft of different issues of which losing weight is only one of the issues that is looked at. There's much broader issues. Um, for the sake of this uh, presentation, we'll focus on the losing weight bit because that's the, the basis of the interview questions that were asked by one of the three groups conducting interviews. Um, but we can understand partly that the food we eat helps to form and shape our sense of identity, our sense of who we are as people. So a lot of food is, for example, ethnically rooted, Indian food, Chinese food, Japanese food, um, you know, Spanish food, Italian food, etc. And so you are likely to be brought up eating whatever the, the standard traditional fare is of the culture into which you're born. And if you move country, or if you're a child, your parents move country and take you with them, then you can be in a country where you're surrounded by people who don't eat what you eat. They're not used to eating the things you are used to eating. Not so much these days in the 21st century, where the supermarkets have gone very multicultural. But certainly if we go back a few decades, then people in Britain, for example, who were Indian or Pakistani or from one of the various African countries would often have found it very difficult to access the sorts of food they were used to eating in their, their home countries. And then they the, the arrive here as migrants and struggle to find their local food. These days, of course, there's lots of multicultural supermarkets and specialist supermarkets and so on. So it's a very different picture. But um, it's not that long since even finding something like spaghetti would have been a real challenge to people, let alone anything more exotic than that. We have other examples here on the screen, things like vegetarianism, veganism, raw food diets and so on. 
Um, some of those may be engaged in for reasons of health or reasons of ethics, not wanting to eat animals and so on. Um, but they also, alongside those kinds of motivations, they also help to form, shape or change a sense of personal identity. So somebody who, let's say, gets to the age of 25 and decides that they are going to go from being an omnivore to being a vegan is not only changing their diet, what they shovel in their face, but they are also changing their sense of identity. In that veganism is, uh, is a form of identity in the sense that people say, oh, if they, they're meeting somebody at a party or wherever it is, oh, I, I'm Fred and I'm a vegan. Not many people would say, I'm Fred and I'm an omnivore, I'll eat any damn thing going. That's not a common form of introduction. So where people will flag up their dietary choices as a, a form of introduction to a stranger, well, you know, I'm interested in, I like macrame, I go to church and I'm a vegan. It becomes one of those things that's flagged up as a, a form of self-disclosure. That's when it starts to form part of an identity, part of a sense of who you are. It structures yourself and it's perhaps also the case, maybe not for everybody, but for a fair proportion of people who go on diets to lose weight, that their choice of diet, whether it's the Atkins diet or one of these endless other diets that prop up every five minutes, um, that in itself can become a topic of discussion when you're meeting people and introducing yourself and you know, talk about the weather and all the usual boring things that British people talk about. Um, to also then move on to discussing food preferences. Why is that? Well, partly it's because food has a very social element to it. It's very much part and parcel of how we engage with each other. But also perhaps because, and this is an argument made here by Levinovitz and a couple of other people as well make a similar sort of argument, that there, there is a religious backdrop to food. Um, in the Western world, Christianity and Judaism, in um, the Middle Eastern world, Islam and, in, and other religions in other parts of the Taoism, China and so on, often have rules and regulations. A lot of religions have rules and regulations around food, what you can eat, what you shouldn't eat, how the food should be prepared, what sorts of food you should eat on different days, days when you shouldn't eat at all because you're meant to be fasting. All of that sort of thing is part and parcel of religion. It becomes the habitus if we want to use Bordeaux's um, phrase, of being a religious person. And even though nowadays there's quite large numbers of people who describe themselves as non-religious, they're atheists or agnostics or what have you, um, nonetheless, Levinowitz, um, sorry, Levinowitz argues that there is still this big hangover, even amongst non-religious people, of religious language, religious thought patterns, religious attitudes not simply to things like God and the afterlife and those sorts of issues, but also to food. Um, so Levinowitz refers to various chapters in Leviticus and Deuteronomy that talk about food and what's unclean food and what's good food. So the idea of unclean food or sinful food, dirty food, food you mustn't eat. And the, the Leviticus um, particularly is where the, the Jewish community get a lot of their um, rules and regulations around not eating pork, not mixing milk, products with meat products and so on, stems from Leviticus. So the notion that there are there are certain forms of food that are sinful is something which Levinowitz says has tipped over into diet books, diet websites, magazines in, well, primarily women's magazines, but also in these kind of men's, men's health and fitness type magazines go on a, a lot about diet as well. Um, and they tend to use religious language. They'll talk about food sins. Uh, and they'll refer to um, whoever's written the diet book as a diet guru. A, a guru is a religious teacher in um, Hinduism and Sikhism. Uh, so the, this idea that it's almost like a mystical role, that someone um, is revealing something to the, the uninitiated that they need to know to achieve enlightenment. Uh, and part of the, the rewards of following the, this holy and in inverted commas life is that you get the body shape you attain to. That's your sort of heavenly reward. And you feel fit and healthy and energetic and this, that and the other. And perhaps are disease free. You know, this, these are the fantasies of 
you can have any diet under the sun and still get ill. Changing your diet won't save you from getting ill. You're just likely to get ill with something different. <laughs> but th these are the sorts of um, undertones that it says permeate the, the realm of deity. But not only in terms of the language, also the notion that in religion, people come together, obviously, for, for rituals and services and so forth, reading their Bible or their Rig Veda or the Quran or whatever it is that they're reading in that given religion. Religion serves a very social function. It brings people together. You sit, you join in prayer, you join in meditation, you go out and do charitable works for the community. You try to be a good person and do the right thing. And part of almost all religions is a sharing of food. So within Judaism, you have the Friday night meal. Uh, if you go to a Sikh Gurdwara or a Hindu Mandir, as well as, as attending the religious services, there are big kitchens and, and people, uh, those religious houses, take turns in cooking the food and serving the food and so on. And so for the people coming to worship, as well as worshipping, they'll sit and eat after the worship is over with. They'll sit and eat. And that's also a kind of an extension of the religious service. The, the sharing of food with other worshippers, chatting, talking, building community. And it's not just religious things they're chatting and talking about. I'm sure they, they talk about what was on TV last night and uh, you know, gossip about the neighbours and all that kind of palaver, the way people do the world over. But it's all part of building a community. The breaking of bread, the sharing of food is a very, very social thing. And just as that happens within religion, and there's a long, long history going back thousands of years, of religion and food and sharing food and the eating of food being part of community, even at the very kind of minimalist scale, you could say, for any of you who are Catholic or at some point in your life used to be Catholic, you go into a Catholic church and a part of the mass is the communion, the, the sip of wine and the eating of the wafer, the, the body and the blood of Christ. I know it's probably the smallest meal you'll ever have in your life. It's not like you're sitting down to some, you know, 15 course banquet or something, but you are eating, you are drinking, and that act of eating and drinking, even if it is a very small amount of food and drink, is nonetheless the absolute core of that religious experience. And you're doing it with other people. There's a long queue of people going up to receive the wine and wafer from the breast. So it's a form of communal meal. Part of that community that coming together is the social element and this again is part of what Levinovitz is arguing that even if you're an atheist or an agnostic and you never step foot inside a church or a mosque in your life if you're on a diet you might go along to Weight Watchers religiously and I use that word intentionally you might sit there and read from the Holy Diet book and discuss the contents of the Holy Diet book with your fellow dieters and during the course of your Weight Watchers meetings or whatever it is, you might say, oh, well, well last week I slipped oh, and I ate a bit of cake oh, and everyone sort of supports you in this. And they say, oh, never mind, you must try harder and resist this backsliding. And it is very much like, well, which again, of religion and someone who says, oh, I, I, I sinned last week. And then everyone prays for them and slaps their tambourine. And there's that element of... Um, a very kind of fervent religious overtone. And this is this is what Levinovitz is getting to. So when you're um, consuming your chosen diet, and this could be a diet for the purpose of losing weight, or it could be a diet in the sense of veganism, vegetarianism, etc. If you're eating with fellow vegetarians or eating with fellow vegans, it's rather like a person attending a religious house and could eating with their fellow worshippers. It's a, an act of bonding, an act of community, an act of togetherness, an act of we are all eating the righteous food and thinking righteous thoughts whilst we are doing it. So there is this, this strong kind of bonding undertone to eating and food, which Levinovitz and various others like Giddens here brings out. It's a form of inclusion. We are all eating together we are, and we are eating the right food together so that we are bonding together. And when we're not eating it, we're discussing recipes for it. And of course, in the 21st century, that goes as far as you know, videoing yourself, preparing a meal and then uploading it to YouTube or somewhere or other. 
uh, TikTok or one of these awful social media things, and we sit and we watch other people cook. And we don't not just in terms of you know, famous celebrity chefs on TV, um, Gordon, um, what's his face, um, um, Delia Smith, and any of the others. We're not just sitting there watching them. Um, preparing their celebrity meals. We're watching random strangers on the internet preparing their meals. And maybe we are copying the recipes or maybe we're just watching it for reasons that are somewhat hard to identify. Um, why do we do it? Well, because food is such a bonding activity. It brings us together. It unites us as a community of people who like that type of food. But where you get inclusion, you also de facto get exclusion of those who do not eat as we eat. The, the, the unbeliever. So the, the ones who are sitting there eating their fatty, sugary foods whilst we are nibbling celery and lettuce. Or the ones that sit there shoveling dead cow down their throat whilst we sit here eating carrots and tofu. Those who do not eat the correct diet, whatever correct means in this context, um, they are outside of us. They are other. They are different. They are excluded from us. And there may be occasions where, of course, you are excluded from them because all your mates want to go for a particular type of meal and you can't eat that meal because you are on a diet and you can't eat whatever it is that they're eating. And so you feel unable to join in with that trip to the restaurant. Um, or, or whatever you know, kind of place it is that they're going to. Uh, and so you feel as if you're sitting on the outside. And even though you will get you know, burger bars that sell veggie burgers, some people might feel very uncomfortable being the only one eating a veggie burger, you know, a big gang full of people scoffing beef burgers. And so even though there is a vegetarian option for them, they choose not to go, or they get suspicious about how quite how veggie it really is, and maybe this company isn't half as you know, vegetarian as it cracks up to be in that kind of thing. Um, so it, it creates barriers as well. So the, the, the choice of diet can both include and exclude at the same time. It's just including one group and excluding a different group. Um, Brown puts forth the argument, and I dare say many of you might have direct personal experience of this, and indeed your interviewees might have direct personal experience of this, that these, these same companies, especially in this day and age, now you have these vast multinational food producers who don't just make one type of food, they make hundreds if not thousands of different food products and ship them all around the world the very same companies that make the fatty sugary things that turn us all in, into very very overweight people will also in the next breath sell you the low fat low sugar healthy so-called alternatives so it's in effect brown's point is that they create the obesity problem and then they sell you the solution to it now you might argue that's a bit unfair on the companies do they create the problem what, does anyone shove the 20th slice of cake down my throat? No, I'm shoveling it down there myself. And I require no assistance whatsoever to shovel cake down my throat. So can I blame the company who makes the cake for somehow? It's not like they're putting a gun to my head and forcing me to eat it. But by producing a lot of food out there, which is high fat, high sugar, and where maybe there is a fairer point to make, this can include not just food that we know is high fat, high sugar, like cake, but it can include foods that you wouldn't even realize have sugar in them in the first place. Um, but they shovel in sugar. So there was a, I don't know if they still do, but there was a period in which companies were putting lots of sugar into beef burgers. And you might well think, why the hell would anyone put sugar in a beef burger? It's because white sugar stimulates appetite it is it's quite a sort of compulsive thing and so you're much more likely to want to eat two or three sugary burgers than you would sugarless burgers so something you wouldn't even imagine has sugar in it can turn out to indeed have sugar in it and so it becomes that that's perhaps more because it's a little bit um furtive a little bit secretive perhaps that fits better with brown suggestion that companies create a problem um, and then sell a solution to it. It is very much a kind of 
hardline capitalist approach. You make maximum money by <laughs> creating an issue and selling, it, selling the cure for the very issue that you yourself have created. Uh, and it's exploitation uh, and so forth. You could perhaps bring in a bit of a Marxist element here and talk about class divisions, but they do chop and change over time, which is something we need to bear in mind. So if we go back to the 16th century, um, being quite heavy set was a sign of wealth. All these, all these polite euphemisms, heavy set. <laughs> If, if, in, in other words, if you were dirt poor, you couldn't afford much of any food, so you tended to be very raw boned, and you would have had a very physical job, male or female, you would have engaged in manual work. So whatever calories you could get from food, you pretty soon burned off through hard manual work. The only people who could realistically put on weight were the, the well-to-do, the ones who didn't have to do the manual work, who could sit around shoveling sugary fatty things in their face and could afford to buy sugary fatty things in the first place. Um, so if you were quite plump, that was a sign you were well off. And so that was the aspirational look. These days, if you are a millionaire, then you get you know, liposuctioned until you look like a skeleton and being super skinny is the sign of wealth. So how we constitute um, the relationship between body and social class chops and changes a lot over time. These days, I suppose if you went into uh, a low-end supermarket, the kind of place where people buy cheap and cheerful, and here's a bit of shameless stereotyping for you, you're more likely to see very, very, very obese people walking around buying very cheap food that's loaded with a ton of fat and sugar, because that's what they can afford. Whereas if you went into some very high end, very in you know, a comparison level of food retail, you're much more likely to see walking skeletons who've been liposuctioned out of existence and who monitor their diets obsessively and, and try to eradicate every hint of sugar, fat, flavor or anything from their diet because that's how they display their wealth, which is, is almost a total flip around from the way people behaved in the 1500s or the 1600s. It's the same with, with um, suntans. You know, these days, if you're super rich, you can be tan to the point where you're virtually orange. Whereas um, back in the 1500s, the only people with tans were the peasants who worked in the fields all day. If you were rich, you stayed indoors and you didn't get tanned and you painted your face white, which you did as once we got into the Regency period, in order to emphasize how rich you were, that you didn't have to go outdoors into the sun and get tanned like the peasants did things flip and turn and change around and around again and again. Um, Gurmov and Williams are certainly not the first people to link um, obesity to feminism, but there's a whole long list of um, people. This is, again, to emphasize a, a modern day Western focus that diet is oriented uh, in the sense of trying to encourage women to lose weight rather than put on weight or rather than encouraging men to alter their body shapes. So different periods of history, different cultures have approached it differently. So it's a modern day Western approach, this notion that women should be skinny. Other, other periods of history, other cultures have thought differently. Um, they've, they have their, their food issues, but they've played out in a different way. Um, Gurnoff and Williams make the point that obesity is socially constructed. Now, you need to emphasize here, they're not saying obesity is imaginary. Because obviously you only have to walk down the Ipswich High Street to realise that's not the case. Um, what they're saying is that the definition, the, the dotted line in which if you are two pounds lighter, you're on one side of the dotted line and you're not obese. Whereas if you're two pounds heavier, you're on the other side of the dotted line and you are classed as obese. Where that dotted line gets drawn is socially constructed. This is their point. So... At what point does a woman, or for that matter, a man, become a beast? How heavy do you have to be? And obviously you have things like the BMI, body mass index, and, and all sorts of different ways in which height and weight and various other factors are um, involved in working out whether someone is overweight. And it's not always clear that you can have someone who's hugely muscular, some real sort of big burly gorilla without an ounce of fat on them, 
but who weighs a lot because they are solid muscle. And you could have somebody else who's quite short and, and, and so on, who's got no muscle at all, and, and they are fairly flabby, and that they've got a high ratio of fat to their, their, their body. So it's not a clear-cut issue, we're just saying. If you are above so many stone and so many pounds, then you're obese. And then we get into gradations. When does obesity become morbid obesity? And again, Gomorth and Williams' point is that there is an element of <coughs> me, arbitrariness. Doctors have to draw a line somewhere. They, they kind of draw it as they go along. And it's not a clear-cut issue. There are some large people who are very flexible, very adaptable. They, they play sports, they dance, they do lots of physically energetic things. There are other people who are very slim, who don't do a damn thing. And therefore... Um, aren't particularly uh, energetic or, or physical. So how do you measure unhealthy? Is it just the, the size of your thighs or is it the amount of fat clogging your arteries or is it the, um, the level of, of activity and, and so forth that a person engages in with them? They're very you know, sporty and running around all the time or doing whatever they do. Uh, how do we assess these notions? Because intrinsic to the notion of obesity is the notion of ill health that to be large is to be unhealthy. And flip side of that, of course, is that to be small is de facto to be healthy, which we know is not always the case. Um, in fact, you can be so small that you become incredibly unhealthy, and that's another thing. How small is too small? How thin is too thin? How, how big is too big? That chops and changes from one period of history to another, one culture to another. Uh, and so there is this social construction at a degree of arbitrariness. Now, obviously, if someone is so large they can't even physically stand up anymore, it will be difficult to argue that is a good thing. But there have been periods of history in which, particularly amongst royalty and the super duper rich, being enormously obese to the point where you, people struggled to stand up was considered a display of extreme wealth. And you just had servants to carry you to places pretty servants with very bad backs, I imagine. Um, so there are, are examples where it has been declared as socially acceptable for a tiny elite of supremely rich individuals in society, but not for the ma majority, not for the masses of society. Um, flagged up earlier that the vast majority of magazines and TV shows and whatnot are directed at women these days. Um, that, but there, there are also now worth factoring in because this was '96. That now we're into 2020. There are a growing number, and I can't quote you statistics on the the, the ratio of male to female here because I haven't looked into it. Might be of an interest, so you could look into yourself. Um, but there are a growing number of men's magazines, uh, male health websites, and so on, which usually take the health focus and the sporty focus. Yeah, um, encouraging men to have six packs and, and, and beefy muscles and burn off their body fat. They exercise all day, take up special diets that will alter their body shape. And then just as you get the competitiveness within female oriented magazines of saying, well, this woman is skinnier than you, her thighs are smaller than yours, her waist is smaller than yours, and effectively setting women to compete with each other. So likewise, the, the male-oriented magazines get men competing with each other. I say, well, this guy's biceps are bigger than yours. This, this one's um, six-pack is more defined than yours. And, and again, setting up competition to, between men to try and out outdo one another. Um, and often it's very, very unhealthy. So whilst if you just glanced casually at the cover of one of these magazines, you'd see some s sort of male model with a very sculpted body. What you're not seeing is, is probably the, the use of diet drugs, the use of steroids, the consumption of diets that can often do considerable damage to the liver and, and will cause all sorts of other problems, not to mention the, the sort of habitus impact. Um, whilst some of these men might be very glamorous to look at, how many women or, or gay guys or whatever would want to be in a relationship with someone they, they hardly ever see because they spend every waking minute down the gym. In order to look that good, it, it's a very life-consuming, time-consuming 
process in which there's very little time left over to do much of anything else. Just as for the women on the glamour magazines, to get the look that they have, that's very, very time consuming, very, very life consuming. And again, with little time left over and probably very little energy left over to do anything else. And none of that is factored in really into the TV shows and magazines and what have you that promote these, these approaches. Now, we could say there is a bit of a shift um, in focus between glamour and health, that diet, uh, weight loss diets, or for men bulking up and getting muscular diets, have tended to either focus on one or the other, but with the one often comes the assumption of the other. Um, so that either people are losing weight for health reasons because they need to be being very large puts burden on your heart, <clears throat> liver and various other bodily functions. Brings in concerns around diabetes and one thing or another. And therefore, if people lose weight, they have less health issues. But the other flip side is the glam, that um, thin people, thin women and, and beefy muscular six pack men look better than the alternative. They're more sexy, they're more in demand. And here becomes an issue, certainly from the feminist perspective, that's had a lot of debate. I'm not aware of anyone who's debated the, the male counterpart of this, but there may well be somebody who has. What is that woman losing weight in order to please herself? You know, she, she wants to be healthier, therefore she is losing weight. Because may, maybe, let's say for argument's sake, she finds herself wheezing when she gets to the top of the staircase and she'd much sooner be able to jog up the stairs and not be wheezing at all. So she thinks to herself, right, I want to lose a stone so I can do this. So it's a kind of self-directed goal. Or is she losing weight because she thinks it would please her husband or her boyfriend, or if she's single, she'll get more dates with men if she's slimmer. And, and from a feminist point of view, that's arguably exploitative and so on. Um, now, whether it's exploitative in the sense that the husband boyfriend has said to her, you need to lose weight, love, or else I'm off running off with somebody else, or whether she simply imagined it because she's been told by a thousand and one magazines that if she doesn't lose weight, she, her husband or boyfriend will ditch her and find someone thinner. There's a moot point. It may not necessarily be the man, the husband in question, who's set anything on toward. It may be social pressure from some other source entirely that has convinced the woman she needs to diet in order to gratify her husband. Um, we could say equally the... Um, the men's magazines, are those men getting their six packs and biceps to please themselves? And if they do that, they're much more likely to be labelled as narcissistic than the women doing on a diet are likely to be labelled as narcissistic. Or are they doing it to impress their wives, their girlfriends, or if they're single, their potential dates, or indeed if they're gay for their boyfriends and so on, um, are they doing it to impress a sexual partner? And if they are, is that as troublesome and concerning as women dieting solely to please their sexual partners? How do we understand the sort of politics and the dynamics and the power struggles within the world? Uh, which again is a conflict theory Marxist angle that it's all about power struggle. Um, a powerful group bullying a less powerful group into doing something that they otherwise perhaps wouldn't do. Um, Foucault would argue that to a large extent society seeks, or the, the social authorities specifically in society, seek to regulate body shape for reasons of health. So in this country, for example, the government might think, oh, we've spent X many millions of pounds on treating illnesses relating to obesity. If we can convince our population to get thinner, we will save a ton of money on medical treatments. And then you get all those TV adverts with the little plasticine figures running about the place, taking up exercise and changing their diet. Um, that's not necessarily a bad thing for the people if they do avoid getting ill and who wants to get ill after all. But the Fuku's argument would be that the government's interest is not so much philanthropy and, and, want, and you know, wanting to look after the health of the nation for kind, cuddly reasons but rather just plain old-fashioned money, save money, 
and also to a degree as during the First World War, the concern that you've got a nation in which people are healthy enough to serve the other functions like going to war and so forth of the nation and, and do the jobs that they're doing, are they fit enough to do it? It becomes an issue in and of itself for Foucault. Uh, Cooley put out the argument around the looking glass self that we imagine how other people see us. And we have to emphasize here the word imagine because how we think other people see us is not necessarily actually how they do see us. So somebody might think, oh God, I'm so ugly, everyone hates me, when in fact, nobody hates them and nobody thinks they're ugly. And somebody else might think, oh my God, I'm so glamorous, everyone adores me. And in fact, no one thinks they're glamorous and no one adores them. So the looking glass self can be quite fallacious, quite misleading in that we can have a totally screwed up notion in our heads as to quite what other people think about us. How do we know what other people think about us? Well, sometimes they, it's because they tell us, straightforward as that. Somebody says, oh, you look like this, and we go, oh, right, okay. Um, and it, that's it, really, nothing more complicated than that. However, however, we can also form images of the, of the looking glass, what other people think of us, that is not based on anything anyone has directly said to us. It's based on our interpretation of their facial expressions, their body language, etc. So you know, we think they are, anyone's ever been in the situation, you walk down the corridor and somebody laughs, do you automatically assume they are laughing at you? They could be laughing at a text they just got or a, or a joke someone told them earlier that they've just remembered. They may be totally oblivious of the fact that you are also in the corridor, but it's, it's easy to think, oh my God, they're laughing at me. And so there's that sort of misinterpretation, not of anything actually said, but of body language and, and, and non-verbal forms of communication. But what about, we have to ask ourselves here at this juncture, what about the impact of magazines, TV shows in the stone age, the internet, on shaping the looking glass self? If you are a 17 year old girl and you have read a thousand different women's magazines over your lifetime, and each and every one of those women's magazines says, boys only like slim women. You must be slim, you must be blonde, you must be this, you must be that. And you've read that again and again and again and again, even if no boy has ever actually directly said that to your face, you've read it a thousand times over. Might you not well form the assumption that boys are looking at you favorably if you're very thin, or unfavorably if you do not think you're very thin. And of course, whether you are thin or not can be an ambiguous thing because we think about anorexic people and so um, Self-perception compared to actual body shape can get very, very skewed, clearly. But who has created that 17-year-old's looking glass self? Is it direct input from actual people that she's had conversations with? Or is it media input saying you must you must believe this, you must think that you and most importantly, you must go and buy all of this stuff to help change yourself, change your look. Because what is the point of these magazines, if not the bedrock of capitalism to sell you stuff? Stuff that five minutes earlier you didn't even know you needed or wanted. Does the same go on with 17-year-old lads? if they're reading all these health and fitness muscle man magazines or indeed watching films in which the heroes have all got six packs and, and square jaws and, and why do they sit there thinking oh i've got to you know i'll never get a girlfriend if i don't look like this so i must chop and change and alter my appearance to look like this in order to win the girl of my dreams what are the relationships between media and looking glass cells not just for 17 year olds, for people of any age group, you are going to be subjected and influenced by the media to which they're exposed. Does the media, in fact, these days become a far larger purveyor of the looking glass self than actual conversations directly with actual human beings? I suspect so personally, but you may have different opinions on this one. And of the various forms of media around, we could then get into discussions, and this could maybe be a dissertation topic at some stage. 
what's more impactful? Are people more influenced by magazines or by TV or by the internet or by something else? Which of these endless different variations of media has the strongest impact? And things going fancy. At one point, so everyone's on Facebook. Then suddenly everyone's on TikTok. Then suddenly everyone's on some other thing. Which of these fads and fancies has the strongest impact on different age groups, different demographics, and so forth? In terms of changing their their looking glass selves, what they think other people think about them. Moving into a somewhat grimmer, darker area, there are website groups called Pro Anna, which means pro anorexia, and Pro Mia, which means pro bulimia. Um, mostly on the dark web. If anyone's unfamiliar with the idea, I'm sure most of you have heard of the dark web, but if any of you are unfamiliar with it, then essentially it's a kind of, well, it's not illegal per se, but it is a uh, an internet service which is practically impossible to track. And so it tends to be very popular with people who want to do things that they don't want tracked for various reasons, frequently criminal, but not always. So these pro websites set up, so you, obviously you've got websites, uh, you can go and look things up, which say, oh, are you worried your daughter is anorexia? Are you worried that you might be bulimic? Here are the signs to look out for. Here are the sources of help you can go to sort of straightforward conventional health advice websites. The pro and pro mia don't work in that way. Um, they are websites run largely by people who are themselves anorexic and bulimic or have various other eating disorders, who give tips and advice to their readers, their followers, on how to sustain their anorexia or their bulimia. How to, you know, if, if they want to go and throw as it would believe mixed with eat a lot and then speed all back up again. And they want to do that without their family noticing, well, here's a, here's a handy hint on how to do it and get away with it without anyone noticing. Um, here's a handy hint on how to reduce your food consumption. Here's a handy hint on this, that, and the other. Um, the ideology taken within a lot of these websites, not necessarily every single one of them, but a lot of these websites, is that Anorexia and bulimia are not mental illnesses, which here they are categorized as being by the DSM version 5. Really. Um, rather, they see them as lifestyle choices. Someone can choose to be bulimic or choose to be anorexic, and it's just a lifestyle thing like you know, any other kind of a lifestyle thing, dyeing your hair or following a particular genre of music or whatever. And so people should be free to follow their choice to be anorexic or bulimic even if that actually kills them many, many years earlier than they otherwise would do. Um, so they, rather than acknowledging the DSM as a valid source of information, and not everyone, I mean, in fairness, the DSM is often criticised by psychiatrists and doctors for getting certain things wrong. So that's not unique in and of itself. But the rejection of the notion that this is a mental illness, that eating disorders are a mental illness, Therein is a big debate and discussion, are they? Um, that's really a remit for psychology rather than sociology. But suffice to say, these groups perceive them as choices rather than as illnesses, and therefore they don't think um, people should be pressured into getting therapy for something they don't regard as an illness in the first place. Do the people who subscribe to these websites get so ill they die? Yes. Quite a lot of them do. It's, it's grim and it's gruesome, but it exists and it begs these questions. When does going on a diet, reducing your food intake, become no longer healthy, but instead an illness, a mental illness or a physical illness or however you want to categorize it? At what point does it become dangerous to diet? So having sort of talked about these magazines and, and media sources that vaunt the joys of you should diet because it's healthy and you, you, you won't get um, diabetes and you won't get heart conditions and you won't get this, that, and the other illness, you'll become a doyen of good health. Well, to a point, yes, but 
as with anything taken to excess, there comes a, a, a dotted line, which if crossed, creates a whole new raft of illnesses. Instead of being healthy, we become very unhealthy, but in different directions, different ways. Can we easily dis define, delineate where that line is? Psychologists struggle to do so, sociologists struggle to do so, doctors struggle to do so. It's not a clear cut thing. At which juncture you can objectively say beyond this point you are unhealthy, just as it's quite difficult in the other direction. So, well, if you are over such and such a weight, you are absolutely definitely unhealthy. So it's it's going in the opposite direction. Say so if you are under such and such a weight, you are definitely unhealthy. It becomes a very difficult thing to do. Um, and there are eating disorders which don't necessarily result in the skeletal appearance associated with anorexia, but can cause nonetheless very severe internal organ damage and all sorts of problems. So it's it's a difficult one, and it maps into all sorts of issues and areas of discussion and confusion. Um, mentioned religion earlier, a lot, lots of religions encourage periods of fasting, and some of those forms of fasting are so extreme, it begs the question, when does religion tip over into mental illness? Um, that historically there have been nuns within the Christian tradition who have claimed to live off the presence of the Holy Spirit and never need to eat, to the point where when finally they died, from what undoubtedly these days would be classified as anorexia, rather than seeing it as a tragedy, it was regarded in that period of history as that that nun being so holy, God had lifted her up to heaven. Not that she'd starved to death, but that she had been translated to the heavenly realms because of her holiness. Um, there are Buddhist monks who dig pits, not so much these days, but in the past, who dig pits, sit in them, and the guys sit there and does not eat and not move. And they sit there until they die and their corpse is then desiccated in position. It kind of mummifies itself to all intents and purposes. Um, there are Hindu mystics who engage in some quite graphically unpleasant behavior. I won't tell you what, but <laughs> um, some quite unpleasant behavior that involves diet and purging their bodies um, and doing some quite strange things who are regarded as mystical rather than mentally ill or disturbed. So when does the one become the other? That's not a clear cut thing. It's, it's not an, an obvious thing. And we could say, is, is this all about controlling the body? Um, here, the question might be who is controlling the body? Is it the individual on the diet controlling their body? If they're doing it for religious reasons, is it a religious authority, a bishop, an imam, or whoever, that is controlling that person's body? If it's uh, someone in a, in a secular sense going on a fatty diet and, and tipping over into anorexia or bulimia, who is controlling that person? Is it self-control, self-determination, or are they being pushed and bullied into it by media influences, by other influences? What if you have catwalk models and pop stars who are um, fairly obviously suffering from severe eating disorders? They are so painfully thin, but they are held up as idols of admiration and they're paid millions and have legions of screaming fans adoring them. What impact does that have on those screaming fans? Do they then want to become as painfully thin as the the model or pop star or, or actress or whoever it is that they're admiring? Or, or is it choice? We're kind of into right realism, left realism disputes here. At what point do we have to say society is pushing you into this? And at what point do we have to say you have got to take responsibility for your choices and your dietary decisions? Not an easy one to answer. And of course, 21st century, we are now into the, the age of Narcissus, where we love to video ourselves and record ourselves and photograph ourselves and bung it up on social media, tracking changes in you. The, the utilization of social media as a force within dieting. 
whether that's you know, people videoing themselves preparing healthy food and saying, oh, look, I'm making this recipe. You could make this recipe too. And then the video turns off. So you don't know if they actually eat the damn thing. <laughs> they go straight in the bin the instant the camera's turned off for a winner. Or they, they nibble half a lettuce leaf and that's it. We don't usually know that they actually eat the healthy food they're making. Or people who do these before and after photographs like the ones you've got here. Or of tracking themselves saying, well, this is me at 35 stone and this is me at 30 stone and this is me at 25 stone until they reach their ideal weight. Um, images can be straightforward, uploaded, box standard images. And I'm not saying it's not helpful, it might well be helpful because again, as we were saying about religion earlier, there is this very social element to dieting, to eating the healthy food and, and uh, or supposedly healthy food and doing the exercise regimes and everything. So people come together to do things, um, whether they come together in the flesh or whether they come together virtually over the internet, it's a none that's still a form of coming together to, to kind of do things communally. Uh, we tend to succeed more when we do things communally. It helps with that self-discipline. If you know you've got 50,000 viewers who are desperate to see the next photo of you when you are half a stone lighter than in the previous photo, that perhaps helps with the self-discipline. Um, or maybe sometimes it just leads to fakery. How many people use Photoshop to manipulate the images so that they look better than they actually are? I haven't got a clue how to use Photoshop, but there's plenty of people out there who do know how to use Photoshop. So that becomes an issue. Goffman's idea, his dramaturgical theory, the front stage, backstage, is this notion of people maintaining a public image which is not in keeping with what they're like when they're not in public, the backstage version. So you get stories I mean, of, of um, actors who appear to be one thing in public, but are quite different in private. So in public, they are you know, super duper macho, rugged heroes, action movie stars. And then in private, there is campers, three rooms of tents and nothing remotely like what they pretend to be in public. And I'm possibly vice versa for that matter. Um, or stars who are always, you know, at children's hospitals and kind and caring and loving and nurturing and being photographed, hugging their fans, and they come across as the loveliest people going. Then the cameras turn off and they're complete and utter monsters. They're just dreadful, but they only maintain a public image. That's the kind of backstage, front stage. But Goffman's point is that that's not just celebrities, it's pretty much all of us. What we are when we're performing, teacher stood in front of the class is performing just the same way as an actor on a stage is performing um, you know, a vicar in the pulpit is performing a politician giving a speech is performing um, going out in public to do your shopping in the supermarket is is kind of performing you're in public so you want to be seen in some way uh, even if that's just putting on clean clothes then then you go home and you slop out on the sofa of your pants that's you backstage, but front stage, you dress up vaguely respectably to go out into public. You wouldn't necessarily want to be seen in public wearing the kind of things you wear at home, perhaps. Or if you sit at home on the telly picking your nose and scratching your bum, you wouldn't necessarily want to be seen in public picking your nose and scratching your bum. So we have this front stage, backstage thing, not just for the famous, but for pretty much all of us. Um, this can apply as much to dieting issues and bodily appearance as it does to everything else. How we alter and adjust our looks. We can understand um, symbolic interactionism, George Mead and all the rest of, of the subsequent interactionists, as their theory is applying to, to the body. Um, the body is a symbol. I don't know what my body is a symbol of, trick to think. <laughs> but there is a symbolism within the body. So there is a, a fad at the moment of this thing called thinspiration, which is people putting up memes of themselves or of other random photographs that nicked off the internet, but usually with, with you know, these positive thinking, upbeat, rather Californian style messages, it's all a bit twee and what have you, to try and encourage others to stick with their diets and do all the things that they're doing. Um, social media drowns in these, these sorts of positive thinking memes, which are beyond tedious. 
why do we want the, the ideal body? Well, what is it we think will happen when we've got this ideal body? That's where the interactionism and the symbolism comes in. Do we imagine that when we have a, our ideal weight is to be, I don't know, what's my ideal weight? Let's make something like 10 stone. <laughs> I can just about remember when I was 10 stone. So that's my ideal body weight. What do I think is going to happen when I achieve 10 stone? When I get down to being 10 stone? Do I think I am going to be inundated with exciting sexual offers? I chance to be a fine thing. Do I think I am going to be blissfully happy and sort of sitting there like Buddha in a nirvana state of complete contentment? Do I think I will get the job I want to get? Do I think I will um, you know, have this wonderful, fantastic lifestyle? where I'll be able to lounge on a, on a beach in Hawaii in a pair of Speedos because I'll have the perfect body and I can go and do things like that. But what do I think is going to happen? Could be any one of a hundred things I like, I think. I finally get to 10 stone. Do I get any of the things I imagine I'm always going to get? Well, <laughs> therein is a whole other question. I might perhaps get some other things that I wanted to get, but I'm probably unlikely to get all of them. I might not get any of them, of course. I might get to 10 stone and find I'm just as bloody miserable as I was when I was 13 stone. It may not change a damn thing. But there is this, this symbolism to the perfect body, that it's not just a body. It's what we think will happen in our lives once we've got our body looking that perfect way. And that's, that's the symbolism that the interactionists are on about. I want to be this thing because when I am this thing, X, Y, Z will happen to me. And it's underpinned by a dichotomy, which relates to a psychologist called Kelly, that we, we didn't really have time to go into, who spoke about dichotomous thinking, um, that we associate the ideal body with purity and goodness and holiness and rightness and healthiness and all these smashing up beat things with uh, semi-religious overtones. And the flip side of that is, of course, if you think that the super duper perfect body is all those good things, by implication, you probably see the imperfect body as being all of the dead opposite things. And it's certainly the case that for a fair stretch of time, not just modern day media, but even going back a few centuries, there has been the popular perception that very overweight people must be lazy, greedy, all of these sort of sinful things within the religious context of sin, gluttony and sloth and so on. Whether they are or not is a whole other question, but there is a popular perception that they must be. So you could be thin as a rake and incredibly lazy and eat like a horse. I know people, I used to be one of those people once upon a time, before I got middle aged, where I could eat a lot and not put on weight. So you could be very thin and extremely gluttonous and lazy. There's, there's no logical association between body size and those sorts of behaviours. Um, but, but, popular view has it that there is an association. And so the symbolic interactionist starts to ask, well, what's going on in the mind of the dieter? How do they perceive their life changing when they reach their ideal body shape? Will they ever reach it? Will it be one of those things that when they're 10 stone, they'll want to be 9 stone? When they're 9 stone, they'll want to be 8 stone? But they'll never, ever be happy and content. Or, or the muscle man at the gym, when, he's, when his biceps are 10 inches, he'll want them to be 15 inches. When they're 15 inches, he'll want them to be 20 inches. He'll never be happy with his body, no matter what he does, perhaps. One question worth asking is, if people look in the mirror and go, oh my God, I'm enormous, I'm hideous, I'm awful, and they're 15 stone, and so they go on a diet and they lose weight. How do they, is that just internalized to them? This is how they see themselves only, or does this point of view also extend to how they see other people? So they're walking down the street, they pass some random person who's 15 stone, 16 stone, 20 stone, whatever they might be. Do they view, well, they, I don't mean they shout stuff out necessarily, but do they privately view in their own mind that, that heavy person in a very negative light if they also view themselves in a very negative light? Or is it a peculiarity of the thinking process that the person heaps scorn upon themselves but doesn't heap scorn upon anyone else who's the same weight or bigger? 
Conversely, you could say if they see someone walking down the street who is ten stone, near the body weight to which they aspire, do they assume that person must be fabulous and wonderful and beautiful and handsome and happy and content? Do they attribute the positive virtues to that other person who is already the size they want to be? Or again, is it entirely self-confined to their own imagination that when they get to that weight, they think they will be all these wonderful things without giving a second thought to anyone else who actually already is that size or that body shape? Difficult to say, but possibly an interesting area to research. Worth, again, reiterating this point made earlier, that this is quite a modern approach to associate slimness with good health and joy and happiness and, and social status and so on. For the vast majority of human history, in fact, pretty much all human history until we get to what, the middle, second half of the 20th century, most people have struggled to eat at all. Starvation has been very, very, very widespread all over the world. People going periods of time without eating anything, or the parents skipping food in order to feed their children, because there isn't enough food for both of them. So hunger has been something which our grandparents and great-grandparents and great-great-grandparents would have known very, very well. Um, not, not the hunger we have today, but I mean, eating lettuce and celery today, where you choose to make yourself hungry, but the kind of hunger that happens when you just can't afford food. There is no food. You wish there were, but there isn't. And so for almost all of human history, the idea of celebration, of joy, of happiness has been associated with abundance, with plenty. That's why we stuff our gobs at Christmas. In fact, most religious festivals involve a degree of eating good food. Unless you're a sour-faced Puritan, most religious festivals involve you know, slapping on a, a good feast because it was a rarity to have excess food. That was a luxury of the super duper rich. So for anyone else to lower down the economic pecking order, the chance to, to scoff was something to be dreamed of. It was associated with happiness and contentment. So this is why we have birthday cake and not birthday lettuce, because cake is good. We celebrate with these things. Our bodies crave them. It's, it's only in the most recent times, and, and then only in certain parts of the world, that we've had an abundance of food where even poor people could eat themselves to the point where they could barely get out the door. For the vast majority of human history, most people were skinny, not out of choice and fashion, but because they just couldn't get enough damn food to keep themselves healthy. And when they could get the food, they made the most of it. They weren't all picky and fastidious. They just, you know, scoffed whatever they could get to scoff. Our bodies, you could argue, and this is not a popular subject in sociology, to start talking about biology, but our bodies have evolved to make the most of food when we can get it. That's why we have sugary, sweet teeth, sweet tooth. Um, that the urge for sugary fatty stuff is there because for most of human history, we haven't had it much of anything to go round. So if you could lay hold to something nice and sweet, it would give you the energy burst you needed to keep going. So you'd scoff lots of it. Nowadays, the problem is we've got so much stuff that our bodies still want to scoff lots and lots of sugary fatty food, even though there's going to be a ton of it tomorrow. Our brain, our bodies have not caught up with the reality of abundance in the West. Obviously, it's many parts of the world don't have abundance, but in the West, we, we have abundance. And that's why we have the kind of dieting oddities that we have in the West today. Our bodies want one thing, and our society offers us something quite different. Okay, that's the end of, of me wittering on about diet. So if you want to pause the video and go and get cake, have some cake, cup of tea, and then we'll move on to the next section. So next section, narrative analysis. What is it? Not something we're going to use this time around for this module, but something you might want to consider for your dissertation. It's 
based on ideas developed by Jerome Bruner, who's a psychologist, boom, 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 rather than a sociologist, but apply heavily into sociology and other areas. It's used quite a lot in English lit, for example, and to some extent in history, um, use of narrative analysis, particularly if people are looking at diaries and autobiographies and that sort of thing. Um, it's dependent on the notion that we tell stories not just in the usual sense of the word that once upon a time there was a little old lady who lived in the cottage who had a pet frog that type of story but anecdotes about our own lives discussing ourselves and well to talk about ourselves to other people oh, yesterday i did this oh you know when i first met my wife or when i first met my husband and blah 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 those kind of life stories are stories and story comes with a certain structure and can be understood in a certain context. And so the sociologist, or indeed for Bruno, the psychologist, can sit and take a story that someone has told, whether that's as a result of being interviewed and asked questions, or it's a, you know, something they've written down as a book, or, or a film, or a radio play, or they've written a newspaper, article, whatever, whatever it is that they've done. They've somehow conveyed their story. And the sociologist, psychologist can take that and analyze it and they can look at elements of the story and they can ask themselves the questions you've got on the screen there these aren't all of the questions that can be asked just an example um, so how is the story structured is there a beginning a middle and end how does it run how does it flow what function does the story serve so why is this person telling this story at this moment in time are they trying to make the audience laugh or they trying to make the audience cry are they trying to make the audience sympathetic or angry and, and work them up to do something? Are they trying to inspire the audience? Are they trying to educate the audience? What, what are they trying to do by telling this story? What's the point of the story? The substance of the story, well, that's what the story is actually about. Both the overt element of what the story appears to be about, but also any covert elements sort of the subtle symbolism that, kind of thing, that might be conveyed in the story which might be picked up on by the audience. How is the story performed? What well, is it told orally? Is it written down? Is it in this day and age, someone talking to a camera like I'm doing now, and then putting their voice, their face out in, into cyberspace to be um, consumed by an audience? Uh, film is a form of performing story. Music, you could argue, is a way of performing story. Songs, are a way of telling a story. You think those country and western songs about my dog is dead and I fell off a bridge and all, all these things. That, it's kind of like a story within the song. How that's performed, how that's put across, there's different ways of, of performing story. So narrative analysis is about trying to dismantle a story and explain the different sections to get an understanding of what's going on in the mind of the storyteller. And what impact it might have on the audience consuming listening to the story. What's the point of narrative analysis? Uh, well, one of the points is that there is a perception that we are a narrative species. Humans are a narrative species. We think in story form. So we structure our ideas and we use stories and the format, the layout of stories to organize our understanding of our own lives, of other people's lives, of the history of the culture we grew up in, or the nature of the world and what we think is going to happen in the future. It helps shape how we think and understand ourselves and the world around us and the people around us. So knowing someone's stories is a way of, of sort of getting into their mind, getting into their head, in a sense. What is important here, and this is that kind of um, subjectivity that we've spoken about in, well, quite a few previous lectures, we've touched on it quite a lot, that because this is a qualitative approach to research, whether or not the story is objectively true is not the key issue. It might be nice to know if it's true or not, but it's not the key issue. The key issue is what purpose does this story serve? So even if the story is complete tosh and made up on the spot, or let's say it's half and half, bits of it are true and bits of it are made up. Even then, the story still serves a purpose. And the people listening to it are influenced by a story, whether or not it is true. 
So understanding the nature, the purpose, the intent of the story is more critical to the researcher than understanding the objective truth of the story. Although you can look at the objective truth and make a comparison between what actually happened and what this person says happened. The names you've got there on the screen, like Bamber and Crossley and so on, are examples of people who've conducted narrative research. If you wanted to think about using this style for future, um, you know, something you do in, in the third year, then they are names you could look up. Um, there are various approaches to this. So an example is um, within feminism, and we are going to go next week into a little bit more detail on feminist research techniques and sociology. Um, but the feminist approach has been to pick out the stories of people who are not normally listened to as much. Um, often uh, the word uses silence. That's, that's, I suggest, a bit of a loaded term to silence someone implies that a powerful group has come along and deliberately shut up a less powerful group. And it may not be the case that there is a deliberate shutting up. It may well just be the case that they they don't pay any attention. They ignore it rather than silence. So people are still talking, they're not silenced. It's just that they're hardly anyone listens to them. So there are disenfranchised groups. Um, the popular uh, word de jour is minority but we need to consider that that's a bit of a nonsense term, especially in feminism, because over half the human race is female. So women are not a minority in the numerical sense of the term. They may in many societies be disenfranchised, but they're not a minority. Um, however, there are groups that are in certain parts of the world minorities. So, um, let's say, Indian people are a minority in Britain. Obviously, they're not a minority in India, <laughs> but they're a minority in Britain. So it's, it's often situationally cited when someone becomes a minority or indeed when they become disenfranchised. So there is that approach of saying, well, who is it that's not normally listened to? Oh, let's go and listen to their stories and find out why they think what they think. And this ties into standpoint theory, which we'll get onto in a minute. Um, so that could be an approach. You could think to yourself, well, is there a group of people who don't get listened to much, who don't get heard about much? I could go and interview someone from that, that group or find archived stories that are pre-existing from people in that group and think about this, this group of people whose opinions are not often heard and, and listen to their story. That could be a thing you might want to do. Um, other styles of approaches are not so much about who you talk to, but rather about the style of analysis that goes on in, um, in the research. So Riesman um, is approaching using structural narrative analysis, which is a particular type of narrative analysis, which says the narrative stories can be seen in these six parts. Now, it's not to say everyone who's going to tell a story starts off with an abstract move to an introduction, gets on to the complication but rather that you can understand these six parts exist within a story, even if they don't always go in that order. And if that's something that particularly interests you, then we can do follow-up sessions. I can record a bit about Riesman and quite how Riesman understands the abstract, the code of the evaluation. So if that's something you are considering doing for level six, um, if, if no one's thinking about doing it, there's not much point in my recording anything. Um, when he's not uh, doing that part, or he's breaking the stories down into that particular structure, he says that there's another approach you can take, which is the dialogic performance, which is to look at um, who says what to who and how and when. Now, if it's something like a novel or a film, then you've got a whole succession of dialogues and performances as different characters say different things to other characters and so forth. If it's just one person telling their story, then that one person is telling their story to that audience. But they, they may flip between different points of view. So somebody could be telling you the story about their their 10th birthday party when they were a 10-year-old, and they might say, well, this happened to me, and then my mum said this, and then my granddad said that. And then, so when they're talking about these other people, even though those people aren't there, 
there, there is a kind of a dialogic performance as the storyteller flips between different characters, if we can call them that, within the process of the story. And that, that takes on a significance in, it, in and of itself. Um, so this is a sort of part and parcel of a, <coughs> excuse me, of a bigger picture of understanding how these things um, can be analysed and understood. And it does depend if you, whether you're looking at an interview of one person telling a story to one interviewer, or whether the story is a novel or a film or a, a, like a sermon, that could be a story of somebody standing up and reading a, or, or telling the story of Jesus or Muhammad or Buddha or whoever in that given religion and conveying stories in that context. That's a form of narrative that can be analyzed and understood. There's all, all different ways of approaching according to, to the, this type of story that you are interested in looking at. So if this is something you'd like to consider for next year's dissertation, let me know and give me a hint as to what kind of approach you think, what sort of stories you're thinking about, and then I'll do a follow-up podcast that's more specific to what you're interested in. Uh, all of this, we can argue, builds on the philosophies of Vygotsky, the Russian um, psychologist and theorist and philosopher who talked about, uh, amongst many other things, he talked about language and how children acquire language and languages language is developed. But part and parcel of that is his idea, Vygotsky's argument, which went down like a lead balloon in Russia, very unpopular with the um, communist regime, uh, more popular in other parts of the world after Vygotsky sadly had died at quite a young age. Uh, but his, his argument is that re reality is a mental construction. So we shape, we understand reality through the lens of our mind. Now that's not like saying there's no such thing as a chair or a table, it's all in my imagination. The chair and the table in the room I'm sitting in may exist, but I have a mental notion in my head, um, a schema essentially, as to quite what constitutes a chair and what a chair is for and how a chair should look. So I have this idea in my head that a chair is this thing I park my bum on and therefore it should be fairly comfortable and have a backrest, unlike a stool, for example, which has no backrest. Um, and I, when I, well, actually I didn't buy these chairs, I, I, I acquired them, I inherited them. But um, when I go out, if I, if I were to go out and buy a chair, I would have an idea in my head as to what I'd want that chair to look like in, in terms of comfort and functionality and color and structure and the materials it's made out. So all of that's mental process. So the actual physical thing I park my bum on is real, obviously. It's not made, it's not imaginary, but it is shaped and structured by all sorts of ideas that exist in my head and in the head of, uh, of the carpenter who made the chairs and in the head of the people who run the shop, own the shop that sells the chairs. What kind of chairs will they sell? What kind of chairs would they not bother selling? That sort of thing. That these are all mental ideas. And so we can understand people's reality as a product of their minds. Bruner picks up on this and says that um, stories and narrative are a way of understanding reality, a way of explaining ourselves to ourselves, of explaining other people to ourselves, of explaining ourselves to other people, of explaining the world at large to ourselves and where we fit into the world at large. We, we have stories about reality. And those stories are always incomplete. They, they don't include every single conceivable thing in existence that would go into them. They are just selected highlights. And one person might select these highlights and a different person talking about essentially the same thing might select different highlights because what is important to one person might not be important to another person. And so that's where the kind of interest for Bruno as a psychologist and um, us as sociologists coming at this might think, well, what's in important to this person? Why is it important to that person? Why is these other things they're not mentioning? Why are they not important? And start asking those sorts of questions. Now, if we were to, if any, I'm not sure if anyone in the class is studying um, English Lit along with this. I can't remember offhand. Probably not. Uh, but within English Lit, um, there are uh, people like Gérard Genet, a French literary theorist, 
um, developed ideas of hypertext and hypotext. Hypertext, that's, that's H-Y-P-E-R, hypertext, is the way in which one a, a book is influenced by other earlier, older books that came before it. And sort of inspired by ideas or uses quotes from or makes references to earlier books. Um, so Genet uh, argues that there's this whole sort of almost like a spider's web of interlinking books in history. This book inspired that book, which inspired that book, which inspired another book. And books interrelate to each other because, of course, people who write books invariably are people who read books. And so the books they have read will inspire and shape and influence the books they go on themselves to write. Which I can assure you is completely true. Um, that, that, that's the way being an author works. And equally, we could say people who compose music are inspired by other pieces of music they've heard earlier on by earlier composers. Um, people who uh, paint pictures are inspired by earlier art that they have seen that's inspired them to paint in a particular way or a style or in, use particular techniques that they've seen elsewhere. It's this interrelationship of one work shaping and influencing another. We could argue eventually that the same is true of stories not just stories in book form in novels and things like that which is exactly what Genet is talking about but if i were to i know we were to, to bump into each other in the canteen and i sit there and i tell you the story about what happened to me when i was on holiday last year and you're sitting there dying of boredom and wishing you would shut the hell up but i'm telling you this story about my last year's holiday what the way I tell you the story of, of my holiday will be shaped and influenced by what might loosely be termed hypertext, uh, it be, become a form of hypertext, shaped and influenced by earlier stories I've heard from other people. So other people told me stories about their holidays and the way they told me their stories and the sorts of things they mentioned and the sorts of things they didn't bother mentioning might impact how I tell you my story now. So the hypotext, the HYPO, is the earlier one. The hyper is the one that comes after the second one that follows on. So stories, not just in the terms of novels and books, but just people talking, chatting, discussing. Stories influence each other. They shape ideas. They shape turns of phrase. They shape, you know, if, if you tell a joke, then you've been influenced by other people You've heard tell jokes earlier. Um, the way someone, you know, Joe Bloggs told a joke and it really made you laugh. Well, when you want to make an audience laugh, you'll be thinking of Joe Bloggs and how he told his joke, and that might inspire you as to how you tell your joke. You tell it in a similar sort of a way. So one oral account inspires another and another and another oral accounts. There are hypertexts and hypertexts. Except here, the text is not a written book, it's an oral account as to how stories interrelate to each other. And arguably, if we want again to risk branching into psychology, boom, 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 um, Aaron Beck, you know, a leading cognitive psychologist, fascinating man, with lots and lots of interesting ideas, argued that destructive thought patterns are at the root of a lot of um, misery and grief and mental health problems and all sorts of things. And these destructive thought patterns are inherited from families to an extent. You, you hear, as you grow up, you hear your mother and father and uncles and aunties and whatnot talking in certain ways, thinking in certain ways, consistently expressing certain points of view. Those points of view shape and influence your points of view. Manifest and, and, and impact upon your way of thinking. So if you grow up with someone who's very gloomy and pessimistic and always looks on the dark side of everything, then that will impact you. So even if you make a conscious effort to try and be upbeat, because you're so sick to death of old misery guts moaning on and on and on, then even your decision to be very upbeat is impacted by that parent's decision to be a right old misery and, and mope and moan all the time. So your, your narrative is a reaction to their narrative. So there is an on, so even if you're not repeating it, you are nonetheless reacting against it. 
So there's this kind of interrelationship between the way people think and how that influences each other, not just families, obviously. You could say, well, you might have been inspired by an author you've read, or you might be inspired by a speech you heard an actor give in a stage play, or you might be inspired by a politician goal. Um, there's all sorts of, of sources of information, not just your own family, all sorts of sources of information of people holding forth ideas that inspire us, sometimes for the good and sometimes for the worse. Um, and we, in our turn, there's a thought, we, in our turn, inspire other people. So the narratives you tell of your life today will impact upon your children, upon your nephews, upon your nieces, upon your friends, upon your relatives, upon random strangers at bus stops you happen to tell your story to. It may impact them in a good way, it may impact them in a bad way, but stories are constantly interrelating. And it does beg this question, is any story wholly private? Because as soon as a story is told, it's out there. Even if you only tell it to one other person, it's out there. And you don't know how many people they might repeat your story to. And a bit like Chinese whispers, when they repeat your story, it's unlikely to be word for word debating the way you said it. They'll change words, they'll drop bits, they'll add bits, tone of voice shifts and moves. So when your story is told by somebody else for a second time, third time, 410th time, it changes and it changes and it changes as it spreads out across the world. There's a big network of narratives. Now, this is Bruner, Jerome Bruner's 10 principles, and I'm not going to sit here and go over all of them because we'll all go mad and die. What I might do is, if I can find the time, create a, a handout that I can upload to Brightspace, which gives a little bit more details on, the, on these 10 points of narrative, just in case any of it is something you might want to work in to your... Um, station what have you next year but these are different ways of understanding how people tell their narratives so just i'll give you a couple of examples just so it's not mindless words on the page and give you a, a hint so the first one up there narrative diachronicity is the idea that every story has a timeline a sequence of events this happens that happens that happens and we could we jump delay jump chop and change in timelines so that, not just in terms of films and TV shows and books, but even just telling a story to someone you meet on the, on the train, telling anecdotes to them. You might not tell things in chronological order. A happened, then B happened, then C happened. So you think, like, as with TV shows, TV shows have flashbacks. You know, you'll have something set in the present, then it will flash back to something in the past, then it will return to the present, and oh, it jumps around the timeline. Well, we do that as well. Now, does the TV show do it because we do it, or do we do it because we've seen the TV shows doing it? But understanding the timeline of the story as it's told, how someone jumps around between past and present and future when they're telling their story, has an interest to Bruno and, and anyone engaging in narrative analysis. Um, hermeneutic composability, the fourth one down the list there. You can tell that Bruno liked long words, can not you? Um, part of this is a quite complex idea, but a, a short version of this is that part of engaging with a story is that you know it is a story. But we don't always know something is a story. Now, the example that Bruno gives, and you have to be a certain age to appreciate this one, is there used to be an actor that has been dead many years now called Orson Welles, who was a very, very famous American actor in his lifetime. Still quite famous now, um, for people who like black and white movies and so on. When Orson Welles was a young man, he, he got famous for him. He made a radio show of H.G. Wells's War of the Worlds story, which is all about the Martians invading Earth. So he made this as a radio show and it was done in a quite realistic way so that uh, it, it felt like um, uh, a series of interviews carried out by radio presenters with uh, soldiers and scientists and people claiming to have witnessed the spaceship landing. It was done in, in a, a quite realistic way. Now, 
supposedly quite a lot of the American audience listening to the broadcast. This is going back quite a long time. Ago. They missed the start. Now, at the start of the broadcast, the the uh, announcer says, and now we go on to Orson Welles's version of it, of the story of your world, well, blah, blah, blah. So it was the people who listened to the whole thing knew it was a story. People who only turned their radio on a few minutes late and missed the start believed that they were hearing news broadcasts. That when the character in the radio program says, oh, tell me, General, did you see the spaceship land? And General says, I saw the spaceship land. And, and goes on, they thought they were listening to a, a newscaster interviewing a real general. And they basically panicked. They thought America really had been invaded by Martians, that they were, uh, and they could hear that the, the, when the spaceships um, kind of animate and the laser beams flashing out the spaceships and kill people and everyone's screaming, they thought they were hearing a live news broadcast in which spaceships, Martians actually had landed in America and really were killing people. And so there was mass panic, people running into the streets, screaming, hollering, thinking, oh my God, we're about to be killed by Martians. And there's a, 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 quite a scandal about it. And then they had to all be calmed, calmed down and said, look, love, it's only a story, it's not real. Um, that's kind of what Bruner is on about. Do you know the story is a story or do you interpret it in a different way? We don't interpret news as a story. We interpret it as real. So if I turn on the TV and I listen, uh, I watch a show about Hercule Poirot interviewing murderers, and, and, or interviewing murderers and, and, and so on, I know it's a story. I know Hercule Poirot doesn't really exist, that that murder hasn't actually happened. I know it's, it's made up. If I turn on the news and there's somebody on that news program saying, oh, the lady in Ipswich has just been murdered, I interpret that as real. That actually there is someone in Ipswich who has been murdered and these are the details of the murder. That this is a made up thing, this is a real thing. Now we can debate going back to Dukes and all the rest of the people who we were talking about for the first assignment about you know, reporting a crime and so on. To what extent do newspapers and TV news programs and so on, to what extent do they fictionalize the news they're reporting? They kind of pad it out a bit, make it up a bit as they go along. Is it really reliable and trustworthy as news or bleh, there's all these gray areas. But however, I as an audience am likely to interpret the news as real, whereas Agatha Christie murder mysteries I know are stories. And in my mind, stories are made up news is real. So how I engage with a story depends, for Bruna, on whether or not I realise it's a story in the first place. He also says another element of this hermeneutic composability is what I know about the author. So if I have an idea about the author being a, sort, a certain sort of person, an author in this sense is quite broad, whoever is telling the story. Not necessarily writing it, it's just the person I'm listening to. What do I know about them? That will start to change how I understand what they're telling me. If I know nothing whatsoever about them, that will also change how I understand what I'm being told. So there's all kind of, these are all different approaches to understanding a story and understanding how people tell the story, but also how the audience consumes, receives the story, how they understand it. And, and a research project at the station could look at either, you could either focus on the teller or you could focus on the audience or, or do a 50-50 thing where you're looking at how it's told and how it's received, how it's understood. All right. Whew. Burke, there's a name, proposed the dramatic pentad. Now, Burke was a literary theorist who is interested in understanding novels and stage plays and things like that. But Burke's ideas have been applied within sociology as well to understand human engagement, how people talk to each other, how they discourse with one another. So Burke says, in a work of fiction, you have these five factors, act, agency, agency, and purpose. The act, what happens? Agency is, is the sense, who caused it to happen? 
what who who is the driving person or people group of people behind why that thing just happened so let's stick with the agatha christie example the act is the body lying upon the floor someone has been murdered that's the act the agency who murdered them who done it the agent the person who did it so the agency in this question why is that person dead well they're dead because they have been killed deliberately they haven't, they haven't just you know, killed over with a heart attack or something they have been deliberately killed there is agency behind it this is an intentional act the agent is the murderer the individual who done it the scene well the body is in the library the library of a stately house and it's set in 1942 and, and that's all part and parcel of the scene the purpose what's the reason behind the murder well I, I, we find out by the final end of the story when hercule pyro or miss marble or whoever it is reveals not only who done it but why they done it and that's a convention of narrative at the end of a murder mystery not only must we find out who the murderer was but we also must find out why they did it it'd be quite odd if you got to the end of an agatha christie story and on the final page miss marple turned around and said well i've got a bloody idea who committed the murder and it ended that was it so you you're, you're left bewildered by the end of the story that that's not how murder mysteries work it's often how real life works plenty of crimes go unsolved no one knows who done what to who and why or any of that but in a story we expect the story to be wrapped up we expect a resolution by the end of the story and real life is quite disappointing when there's no resolution and so when we're telling events in our life things that have happened to us or happened to people we know we're telling those those stories to other people on trains or bus stops or wherever the hell it is we're telling these stories it's very tempting and this is where Bruno gets interested in things as well it's very tempting to add in a resolution if there was no resolution in real life well we don't know who did it but here's who i think did it and this is why i think they did it because we want there to be a resolution we want life to fit narrative and so you can understand a story you take someone's story and you can look at it in terms of this dramatic pentad what happened who done it why did they do it what's the background what's the reason behind why they did what they did what's their driving force their driving motivation in act so oh, love here what's my motivation behind doing this we want there to be a reason we don't want the motivation to be random insanity we want there to be some purpose it's not just oh i felt like it we want something a bit more concrete behind why people do what they do and not just murders anything anything whatsoever why do people do what they do what's the impulse the reality may be something quite quite silly quite bland but we want it to make sense in narrative and so we tend to change things around to create a narrative so your other half turns up and presents you with a box of chocolates unexpectedly it's not your birthday or anything they just present you with a box of chocolates and you want to know why why have you presented this box of chocolates is it because you've done something and you feel guilty is it because you're just a spontaneously lovely smashing human being is it to say thank you for something i did for you that i forgot about when you've never given me a box of chocolates as an expression of gratitude what it what is the motivation behind doing this thing what is the purpose we want there to be intelligible understandable purposes that make sense even if in real life that's not always the case nearly finished so moving on to standpoint theory right in the photo is sandra harding um, who is a uh, leading feminist sociologist and a proponent of standpoint theory standpoint theory is the idea that all research is subjective all academic research is subjective um, here we're talking sociology but you could apply this to any other kind of academic discipline but we stick to sociology so somebody comes into conduct research and theoretically it's only if, if we were looking at let's say psychology and experimental psychology which makes a great insistence on objectivity harding's critique 
is that even when you think you're being objective, you're not. You're being subjective because you, as the researcher, are a human being with values and, and morals and what have you. And your humanity makes you subjective and you can't get away from that no matter how hard you try. So what you should do from Harding's point of view is own up to your bias. This is why sociological research has that reflexivity section. State your bias up front, don't hide it, just state it. Try, try to you know, rein it in a bit when you're doing the research, if you can, but own it, essentially. Further than this, Harding argues that social sciences should apply, aspire to what she terms strong objectivity. Now, it may sound slightly contradictory, having just said that she doesn't think you can be objective as an individual. What she thinks we can achieve objectivity in as a discipline is the convergence of many voices. Now, bearing in mind that a lot of her writing goes back to the 70s, um, when sociology was quite male dominated, most of the writers and the academics and the teachers and the lecturers and whatnot were men. These days, um, there's a very large percentage of female researchers. Um, female, well, as you know from your own experience, almost all of the students in the class are female. That's not just a weird thing happening this year in West Suffolk. That's true of most sociology classes wherever we are in the world. Yeah, it's a subject of more interest to women these days than to men in terms of the gender of students. And obviously when those students graduate and move on to become lecturers and researchers and whatnot themselves, we see a preponderance of women these days. But back when Sandra Harding was first starting to write and research, it was the other way around. And so her argument was that an awful lot of sociological research back in the 70s was written by men and would naturally be from their point of view and would naturally be about things that interested them. And her argument was that the, the kind of things that interest men, the kind of topics that interest men, the approaches that men are more likely to take are different than the kinds of things that interest women and the kind of approaches that women might take. So in order for sociology as a discipline to be objective, what it needs is a good mix of male and female voices, not just mostly men. And equally, we would say these days, not just mostly women, but a good mix. So the objectivity is not the objectivity of one individual researcher, rather it's the objectivity of the whole subject, the whole discipline, which is obtained by getting a, a broad mix of researchers approaching from different angles. And that broad mix, she says, should be a combination of not only those who are in the kind of elite elites of society, whatever that elite happens to be in that given society, in that given period of history, but also people whose voices are not often heard. So going back to this thing about voices that are ignored or indeed even silenced, um, people who are less often heard from should be encouraged to step up to the plate, to move forward into the realm of academic research and start subject, studying subjects, researching subjects that interest them and talking about their point of view and using methodologies that suit with their approach to life, which she says are likely to be quite different from the points of view and the experiences and the methodologies favored by people who are in the, the more dominant social groups in society. So she was thinking mainly in terms of men and women, but you could equally say this could apply to people with different ethnic backgrounds, different religious backgrounds, people from different social class backgrounds, so if we're thinking of who, who goes into study sociology these days, is it mainly people from working class backgrounds, middle class backgrounds, upper class backgrounds, um, of those who qualify and then pursue a career either teaching sociology or researching sociology, so that um, lots of people study sociology and then go and get a completely different type of job. But for those who stick with sociology once they're qualified, how many of them are middle class, working class, upper class? Is there a class bias in sociology? Is there a racial bias in sociology in the West? And obviously, if you were in Zimbabwe, most sociologists in Zimbabwe are black. If you're in Britain, are most sociologists white? Not probably. Um, if 
is, is there a religious bias? Are most sociologists atheists or Christians or Jewish or Buddhist or whatever? What's, what's the biases that we could look at? And so her argument would be say, whichever is the bigger group, it's worth getting people from these small groups, the, the underrepresented, and getting their voices to the table so that when you can hear as, as readers of sociology, if you can read reviews and research and what have you from men and women, from black people and white people and Asian people and Chinese people, from Christians and Muslims and Jews and Hindus and atheists and agnostics, from the rich and from the poor, from this and that and the other. Once you've got all of these mixes of views, then you're more likely to get the subject itself being objective, even if each individual researcher is subjective. That's standpoint theory, and we'll come back to that a little bit more next week. That, that's, that's just a kind of summation of where we're at. Um, epistemic advantage um, is to have an advantage of epistemology, of defining the, the roots by which we know what we claim to know. And there are different ways of defining knowledge, different forms of epistemology. The argument made by feminists and, and by some other um, people subscribing to other ideologies, but particularly by feminists, is that there are certain forms of epistemology which are granted higher status, are seen as more advantageous than others within the academic realm. So if you have epistemology A, that's more likely to get academic kudos than if you have epistemology B, C or D. And part of the argument within feminism is that male approaches to knowledge are more favoured than female approaches to knowledge, which may well have completely changed by now because of the gender shift from mostly male sociologists to mostly female sociologists. So maybe it's the other way around now. But feminism often has a tendency within sociology to focus on the way things were a few decades ago, rather than necessarily with the way they are now. Um, do women have different forms of epistemology? Do women use different sources of knowledge, different styles of assessing whether or not something is reliable than men do? And this is something we'll discuss more next week. So this is just flagging it up now, so you can have a week to think about it, mull it over, and um, have your own ideas and views by the time you listen to lecture number 11. Um, if, if not just applying this to men and women, could we say people from different ethnic backgrounds think in different ways, are more likely to use one type of epistemology than another type? What about social class? If you're middle class, are you more likely to go down one route than someone working class? Um, this, this, I suppose, is all a bit airy fairy, really, isn't it? I'm trying to give you an example that's a bit more practical. Would you be more inclined to believe something that you have read in The Guardian than something that you have read, some news article, that you have read in The Daily Mirror or The Sun? Now, different people read different newspapers. Some people like me don't read them at all. But would you, what, which source of information, The Sun, The Guardian, the Daily Mirror, would you regard as more reliable in terms of informing you accurately and about important issues, about real things that have gone on rather than just making the news up as they go along? Who's more reliable, who's less reliable? Now, choice of newspaper to some extent is related to social class. You're more likely to get working class people read The Sun and more likely to get middle class people reading The Guardian for example. If somebody says, I know this to be true because I read it in the sun, how would you react? Would you, get, would you believe them? Would you fall about laughing? Would you be completely neutral on that? What if they said, I know this to be true because I read, read it in the Telegraph or because I read it in the Times or because I read it in the Socialist Worker? Is there a, a, an element of class going on here? What if somebody says, I know this to be true because I read it in Women's Weekly? Is that a gender related issue? Or a class related issue? Or an age? I, mean, I don't know what the age demographic is for reading Women's Weekly. <laughs> um, are there demographic factors going on here? So how do we understand the nature of epistemology? 
doesn't have to be confined to gender dynamic. It can be social class, it can be ethnicity, it can be religion, it can be any damn thing you get to think of. Have different groups of people, different favoured epistemologies to which they argue then says, I know this to be true because dot, 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 dot. So have a think about that one. And think does, let's say, well, let's go with academia for the moment. Does the academic world favour certain forms of epistemology over others? Well, the answer to that is yes. But the, um, have a think about the detail. What styles of epistemology does the academic world, particularly sociology, favour over others? So what would you put in, a, in a, an essay? If you wanted me as the person reading the essay, or, or anyone for that matter reading the essay, to take your statements credibly, to believe what you're saying, what kind of sources of knowledge would you cite? This, this is your epistemological plan. This is true because I read it here. What sources would you cite as being very, very reliable? What sources would you avoid as being sort of dodgy or cringeworthy or, or embarrassing or whatever? Now, thankfully for my throat, we're at the end and very thankfully for your ears. Next week, we'll get on to feminist research approaches. We'll look at queer theory research methodologies and how both of those things relate to activism research. And there'll be some assignment support for interview analysis. Um, Sarah has circulated an email to some of you, at least I know some of you have already done the second assignment anyway and uploaded it. Um, there have been requests for a postponement of date. The most you'll get if I postpone would be a week, because that's, that's what we're allowed to do, to put it back a week. However, if you put in for a deferment, you can get up to 10 days deferment. And um, if you put in for an extension, you can potentially get a couple of months extension on the second assignment. So you'll actually get more time to work on your second assignment if you either go for deferment or extension than if you just ask me to put back the date which is one of the reasons why we're encouraging you to go down that route at the moment. And um, the evidence required is, is much relaxed whilst we're in lockdown and quarantine than it would be normally. So I suggest you go down those routes, um, give yourself extra time in which to do the work that you need to get done. But there'll be support for the interview analysis next week. So that's the end of this one. Take care, stay safe.